Factor investing is increasingly in the spotlight. Financial magazines run features on it, seminars are organised on the subject, and investors consider adopting its approach. Yet you might wonder, is it just a hype? Is the increased interest in Factor investing no more than a passing trend? This question demands an answer because investors are prone to hype. The answer lies in how Factor investing came about. But first, we will explain what Factor investing is. Factor investing is a systematic approach to investing strategically in certain parts of the financial market which realise better returns over longer periods than those in other segments. Leading academic studies from the 70s onwards demonstrate that value, momentum, small cap and low volatility stocks, for example, systematically generate higher risk-adjusted returns. So, how did the story of factor investing begin? The story starts in the 1970s, when academic researchers began to challenge the prevailing assumptions of the capital asset pricing model. This model envisions a fictitious world where markets are efficient and investors are rational. It predicts a positive linear relationship between risk and return. In the 1970s, academics approached asset pricing with normative theories. This makes sense, since financial data and computational power were not readily available. At that time, it was better to stick to financial theory when knowledge could not be acquired by means of observation. This situation changed when better data and increasing computational power led to the predominance of empirical research. Academics gained a much better understanding of the pricing of stocks and other financial securities. For example, in 1972, Robert Haugen and James Hines studied the returns of stocks and came to a surprising conclusion. The relationship between risk and return is not linear at all, and contrary to the prevailing theory, low-risk stocks actually produced higher returns than you would expect. Haugen finally emerged as the father of low-volatility investing, which became one of the building blocks of factor investing. But others were also questioning the descriptive powers of the capital asset pricing model. Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French studied the returns of different groups of stocks in the 1990s, and their results showed that small caps and value stocks performed markedly better than the prevailing model would lead you to expect. The study proved that certain parts of the market can yield higher returns and that not all stock performance is explained by market risk, but also by other factors. A further building block for factor investing was added in the early 90s. Jagadish and Titman proved that past leaders on performance were also likely to be future winners. This phenomenon later became known as the momentum effect. Although the academic evidence started to mount that professional investors might benefit from extra returns or lower risk through factor investing, they were slow to implement it. Some investors started to tilt their portfolios to factors, but high conviction strategic allocation to factors failed to happen. Their organisations were still focused on asset classes in different regions. Implementing factor investing would therefore involve organisational restructuring, which in some cases could be quite challenging. But the global financial crisis of 2008 provided an unexpected breakthrough. Norway would become the starting point of a revolution. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which invests the country's oil and gas revenues, had a size of approximately 300 billion US dollars in 2008. In October 2008, just one month after the fall of Lehman Brothers, the fund had lost 17% of its value. By investing in stocks, bonds, real estate and private equity across different regions, the fund was supposed to be well diversified. A thorough investigation was commissioned. The investigation into the fund's performance was headed by three famous academics, Ang, Gertzman and Schaefer. They found that its performance was largely explained by exposure to different factors, something the fund was not aware of at the time. The active portfolio suffered a large, dramatic dip. Many of the different asset classes had exposure to the same factors. The portfolio was therefore not well diversified at all. These three academics advised the Norwegian government to explicitly allocate to factors instead of assets. Professional investors around the world faced similar problems with diversification and were open to new approaches. To get back to the question whether factor investing is just a hype, not at all. Although factor investing has gained ground only slowly over recent decades and a worldwide crisis was needed to boost the adoption process, we see today that factor investing is increasingly in the spotlights. We strongly believe that factor investing is here to stay for two reasons. First, it builds on years of academic research that proves it works. And second, more and more empirical evidence is being put into practice. Growing numbers of institutional and professional investors already allocate part of their portfolio to factor investing. Some saw the potential of factor investing at an early stage. Asset manager Rubico is one such pioneer. The company has a long history in quant research and works together closely with leading universities in the field of econometrics. The company conducts its own empirical research and has developed a range of factor strategies for investors. Besides that, Rubico also measures factor exposures in existing professional portfolios and advises clients on how to combine different factor strategies and helps in constructing optimal factor investing solutions. 
Isn't it time you too found out more about factor investing? 